Lecture number 31, Arminianism and the External Attack on Reformation Orthodoxy. I may say, uh, when I was discussing Puritanism with you in the last uh, lecture, I had only a few moments at the end to think of its practical effects on society, which are still being uh, felt. I was recalling, and at that time I was resisting as that clock moved relentlessly on, this particular statement of C.S. Lewis, but I think I'll take a moment at the beginning of this lecture uh, to show you how that distinguished writer Lewis recognized the influence and power and usefulness of Puritanism. And it's in his screw tape letters where the senior devil is giving the younger devil devilish lessons on how to influence and corrupt people, that he makes the statement, you know, when we gave Puritanism a bad name, we set morals back a hundred years. He may have understated his success in that regard, but Puritanism, as the very word suggests, was emphatic about purity in church and in the person, and of course it stood inflexibly floored, and any kind of antinomianism such as we have seen appear in the church of the past was militantly resisted by it. There was no such thing as a Christian who was not living a moral life. It may not be perfect, but he nevertheless is endeavoring after uh, perfection, and again, uh, there's no period in the history of the church where that doctrine has better been articulated or exemplified than in the Puritan tradition. Now coming to our uh, Puritanism, you see, as counteracting what I was saying uh, was a tendency right within Calvinism from John Calvin himself to militate against Calvinism, namely that view that children of the covenant in some sense of the word, be elect or certainly to be regenerated or some such notion as that. That was an internal problem, which is still working at the foundations of Calvinism and is more powerful now than it was in the Puritan age that Puritanism was so effectively opposing. But when we come to Arminianism, we're having an attack from without. Still in the church, of course. These are fellow Christians, but they nevertheless are out of the Calvinistic tradition and opposing it with great vigor and extreme success. The Counter-Reformation may have erred by an overly sanguine view of baptismal regeneration with its effect of making baptized children confident of possessing salvation rather than seeking for it. Two. That was and remains a serious mistake, but not so serious as the Arminian attack from without, because that, while encouraging all to seek salvation, taught a way of doing so that could never result in finding. You get what I'm driving at there? The worst thing about this reform slippage within the ranks that gave the child to think it had a status the biblical teachings do not warrant, and thus, in extreme form at least, would say that children shouldn't be a field for evangelism, that you would assume they are converted and try to build them up in the holy faith of Jesus Christ. That was very bad. Um, Arminianism generally doesn't suffer from that particular tendency. They believe, of course, most of them do believe in infant baptism. But evangelical Arminianism has never been inclined, as far as I know, to move to the idea that the child was born of God because it was born in the Christian church. Now, Arminianism, however, while at that point it's even a corrective for Calvinism, does something far worse than this tendency in Calvinism that we have been noting that is not really a part of it, systematically speaking. The Arminian tendency is, as we showed in Arminius himself earlier, and I'm now indicating the fact that it's becoming a full-fledged attack on the biblical reform faith, was that man 
himself, the sinner, sinful man, himself, can initiate faith. which brings regeneration. I would even use the word re necessitates regeneration. We all agree regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't know any Christian who has ever suggested a man can regenerate himself. Now the regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> but man according to Arminianism, can initiate the faith which brings regeneration, which indeed necessitates the Holy Spirit to bestow regeneration. If you believe, you very seldom get an Arminian to say that. Now here again, you notice that same thing. You can have a rampant heresy, but to state it in a certain way in which you can't mistake seeing it is something which people naturally uh, resist. An Arminian would find it difficult to say that you make the Holy Spirit regenerate you. It's built right into their theology. That's what they're saying in every other conceivable way. But you can see a certain reluctance to have a man dictate to the third person of the Godhead. But nevertheless, if anyone in this audience, according to Arminianism, believes the Holy Spirit has to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, he cannot refuse to do so. It's out of his hand. It's entirely in your hand. Now, another thing I'd like to labor a little bit while we're looking at this ersatz uh, uh, statement of Arminianism, but I'm underlining the word initiate because sometimes when Calvinists hear that this is the Arminian way of speaking and are quite persuaded that it is wrong to speak that way, they actually don't notice this word, and they'll even use the term exercise faith. And they think of the Arminians as sinning because they say it's necessary to exercise faith. Well, of course, every Calvinist says exactly the same thing. And as we've noted, the heart of the Reformation was justification by faith alone. You are justified unless you exercise faith. What we're censoring in Arminianism at this particular point is not that they believe in the exercising of faith. Thank God they do that. Everybody must realize that we must exercise faith and we hope to be saved and so on. But what they are claiming, which is anti-biblical and not essentially biblical, is that the person, the sinner, initiates faith. Here again, I, uh, I mentioned something that I... I think I alluded to, but I don't believe I mentioned. I'm probably in the handout theology, as a matter of fact. But the uh, no, I think it comes later. But anyway, this is what I'm uh, saying here. A man named Taylor, a contemporary of Wesley, John Wesley, and of Jonathan Edwards, wrote a vicious attack on the doctrine of original sin. Both of these men, Wesley in England and Edwards in New England wrote a devastating reply to Taylor defending the biblical doctrine of sin. Up to a certain point, they not only oppose Taylor, but they oppose him along the same lines and show his profound unbiblicality and perversion of biblical texts and so on. And it's very evident to Taylor and anybody who read their books there that these people believe he has made a profound mistake. Original sin is clearly and undeniably taught in the Bible. But then when Edwards and Wesley continue having demolished Taylor and so on, a very significant difference appears between the two advocates of original sin. They both say men are born dead, and rightly so. They sinned in Adam, and God can rightly condemn them. Edward says that, and no less clearly, John Wesley says that. But the interesting thing is that once Wesley has said that, he then goes on to say that God has to give these dead sinners a chance to be saved. You don't find the word chance in Edwards. You don't find the thought in Edwards. I don't see how any logical mind could believe that God had an obligation to dead people. If they're rightly condemned, 
could see how God out of mercy might save them, but how could he possibly have an obligation which would spell that their salvation was a matter of justice or at least their chance to be saved? That's bad enough. But Edwards, I mean, Wesley also entertains the idea that these people whom he says are under the judgment of God and morally incapacitated, who must receive a chance, that they actually are able to initiate the faith, which brings the regeneration. Somehow or other, the confrontation of these two giant representatives of Calvinism by Edwards and Arminianism by Wesley and so on show the profound agreement they have against liberal heresies. Remember, we've always said there are three traditions in the church from the very beginning, Pelagianism, Socinianism, liberalism, Arminianism, semi-Pelagianism, and on the other hand, Augustinianism, Calvinism, Reformed theology. We see in a dramatic confrontation like that that the liberal tailor is rejected out of hand by the Arminian Edwards and by the Ca Arminian Wesley and the Calvinistic uh, Edwards. But once you see that though these are the only two conceivably viable forms of Christianity, and this can't even pass muster as possibly Christian and is in another category altogether and so on, once you see that these two stand on biblical grounds against this anti-biblical stance, they have a profound difference among themselves as to what that biblical ground is and you can also see that this is a different scheme of salvation altogether if this dead in trespasses sinner is entitled to another chance and is actually, though dead, able to take advantage of that chance if he did receive it. Number three, this deep and fatal error came from a defective view of the fall. Defective at the point that even though it reduced man to the judgment of God and in a hopeless moral condition, nevertheless insisted that for God to be fair, he had to be given a chance, and somehow or other that got wrapped up with an idea of an ability that a dead man could never uh, possess. It was a defective view of the fall in that sense of the word, but I'm underlining the fact, in spite of the fact that it defended the doctrine of the fall. Wesley wasn't attacking that doctrine as John Taylor of Norwich was. He was defending it. But no sooner had he defended it than he introduced ideas utterly incompatible with that defense. Let me read that sentence again, the whole sentence. This deep and fatal error came from a defective view of the fall, or rather from a defective deduction from a correct view of the fall. Four. Let me explain with John Wesley as a principal, the influential example, John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards both wrote defenses of original sin. I'm just writing here now what I've already expounded, so I needn't take any further time on that. Five, after defending original sin, essentially as Edwards did, Wesley's book departed radically from Edwards. Wesley contended that though man was guilty of the fall and deserving divine wrath, God had to give him a chance to be saved. Why a man who deserves to die must be given a chance to be saved, Wesley never explained, nor did he see that would change the gospel from a gospel of grace to a gospel of justice to, uh, number six, to make matters even worse, Wesley assumed that the sinner given this chance was able, though totally fallen, to avail himself of it and choose Christ and salvation. I don't think I have to explain that anymore, having given you that illustration on the blackboard. Number seven, such ideas are not found in the Bible, nor did they cross Edwards' mind. If the unregenerate sinner sought salvation, it would be a work of the flesh and not of faith. Now, here we're introducing a concept that's not yet been mentioned, and I've never met an Arminian who's aware of it. I'm sure there must be those who are. I just simply, I'll emphasize the fact, I have never met a an Arminian who is aware of it, and I can't imagine anybody who is aware of this and would actually agree with it could possibly continue an Arminian. And most of them don't even think of this. 
They haven't heard Calvinists say it for some reason or other, or it hasn't registered. But what I'm saying is, if they ever got the idea and couldn't refute it, I think they'd have to admit that there's something profoundly wrong with their Arminian system and that it's anti-evangelistic rather than evangelistic. Let me read the statement again and explain it a little bit more. If the unregenerate sinner sought salvation as the Arminians entertain it, it would be a work of the flesh and not of the faith. When our Lord has his dialogue with Nicodemus, he first says, except the person be born again, he can't see the kingdom. That is, he can grasp it, he can understand what Jesus is saying. Nicodemus had trouble really accepting it, not so much understanding it. For example, must I enter again my mother's womb and be born when Jesus says you must be born again and so on? Now he knows that Jesus doesn't mean that, but he's grasping the radicality of the idea. And then our Lord continues, you know, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom. And there again, the idea is clear. It's very simple language, very straightforward, nothing complex or subtle about it. It's staggering because it's introducing an idea that uh, apparently Nicodemus had never considered before and didn't know what to do with. He thought he was puzzled, but he was more confounded because he couldn't quite see how this could be. It wasn't that he couldn't see what Jesus Christ was saying, but in that context, where our Lord goes on to say he must be born from above, this is a work of the Spirit, who is sovereign, as the wind which blows where it pleases, so the Spirit moves where he pleases. And then when Christ makes this remark, what, what is flesh is flesh. What is spirit is spirit. Here is a man as he's born into the world, dead in trespasses and sins. Unless he's made over again by regeneration, he can't see in the sense of grasp any attractiveness in or enter that particular kingdom. If he acts as he is in his fallen and dead condition, his act will be an act of the flesh. That which is flesh is flesh. So if, for example, he rejects the doctrine of regeneration out of hand, as liberals do, for example, that's a very natural fleshly response. That's exactly the way the flesh would respond to an invitation to be made different. The flesh is very satisfied with itself. Everybody does what's right in his own eyes. He doesn't care to be chosen, be, uh, to be remade at all. So if you tell him to be born again, he will reject it out of hand as a natural fleshly response to a repugnant idea which he understands quite well but detests thoroughly and so on. What the Arminian needs to realize is this that even if the person was somehow sympathetic with what was being said and recognized that the one who said it was the Son of God and would be therefore not necessarily hostile to it, downright sympathetic perhaps, if he responded, presumably favorably, but without having been regenerated, by the Spirit of God, that would be an act of the flesh and not an act of the Spirit. See, the difference between the liberal anti-Christian and the Arminian evangelical Christian as he thinks of himself and so on is this, the flesh seen more clearly and accepted more easily by the liberal quite easily says as an act of the flesh, I don't, I don't accept this idea. This business of Christ's blood being the means for my salvation and my changing my whole life. No, 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 nonsense. An Arminian, on the other hand, because he respects Christ and so on, thinks that he has it in him to initiate a favorable response, to initiate faith. Now, since he doesn't have it in him, since he, unless he realizes, unless he's born again, anything he does is going to be a work of the flesh. Then even when he says he believes, he doesn't believe. Even when he comes to Christ, he's going away from him. What he's doing is a work of the flesh. So in a very grim way, I have to say, if an Arminian evangelist is ever successful 
He's a total failure. If anybody ever responds to an invitation to Jesus Christ on the Arminian supposition that he can of his unregenerate self, which is the Arminian notion, he is not responding to Christ. He's as hostile to Christ as any liberal would be. The only fundamental difference being the liberal knows it and the Arminian doesn't. The liberal suffers no illusions, but the Arminian actually thinks he's coming to Jesus Christ. Now, I hasten to add, I'm not saying that everybody who comes in response to an Arminian invitation comes as an act of the flesh. I'll say it again very slowly. Anyone who comes in response to an Arminian invitation on the basis of Arminian theology couldn't possibly be coming to Jesus Christ. It's a work of the flesh. Now, he may have. See here, for example, he erroneously supposes that he initiates the faith. And if indeed he did initiate the faith, you know full well that's a spurious faith. It's not a real faith. But in the context of the Arminian presenting the basic rudiments of the gospel, which a liberal would never present, a person could be truly converted. He could be regenerated and have a real faith and even labor under the illusion that he initiated it and actually be exercising true faith because the Holy Spirit did initiate it by giving him a new heart and so on. You get what I'm saying here? If a person understands Reformed, the I mean, Arminian theology and supposes that he of him, uh, his unregenerate self can come to Christ, that's going to be a work of the flesh. But it is possible in this very strange world in which we live for a person actually truly to be born of God, the Calvinistic way by regeneration, which leads to the faith, and even labor under the illusion that he initiated the faith when, as a matter of fact, what he did do was exercise the faith which God had initiated, he could be truly converted. Again, to put it in a very simple sentence, you could never be converted on Arminian theological bases, but you could very well be converted through a misunderstanding of them in an Arminian context. And I think many people have been. Thank God God doesn't destroy the effect of the gospel just because the preacher of the gospel may misunderstand it and, in principle, destroy it. Number uh, eight, if the unregenerate sinner sought salvation, it would be a work of the flesh and not of faith. A bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit, says Wesley's Lord. Number nine, thus Arminianism, while affirming the Bible's doctrine of original uh, sin, denied its doctrine of the divine initiative. Ten, to him that has shall be given to him that has not shall be taken what he has. Now, I end on that somber note because I think you have to realize that while we can entertain hopeful outcomes of unhopeful uh, proceedings and so on, we still have to hold people responsible for what they actually say and the consistency of their principles. And consequently, if a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit, and Arminianism is a bad tree at the point at which it differs from Calvinism. Now, it's not a bad tree when it says Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead, that God is triune and the Bible is the word of God and the atonement's of verity and faith is necessary. It couldn't be more right, not a bad tree that way, but in addition to that, it teaches these other principles as well and they become foundational in its actual evangelism. Then we have to say, according to that formula of our Lord, to him that has not the realization that flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit and never the twain will really meet, he will lose what he actually does have. Do you get what I'm saying here? There's a built-in tendency in Arminianism because of its error to turn away from the truth which it possesses. I mean, you can't go on misconstruing Christ and misrepresenting him even while you love him and even while you endeavor to be obedient to them. The moment of truth has to come 
When this person, especially in exchange with other, exchange and debate with other persons, realizes the inconsistency comes the moment of truth. Is he going still to say, I'm going to hold on to my principles even though this is a corollary? And he wants to see this type of thing and recognize that it's contrary to what Jesus Christ teaches and still maintain he is a Christian? In a certain sense, ignorance is bliss. It is folly to be wise. And I think some Arminians almost sense that particular point. They, they do love Christ. They do want to be with Christ. They at the same time know a responsibility for being faithful to Christ. And if it's brought home to them that this particular doctrine of theirs is crass unfaithfulness, but it's become a part of their evangelism so deep and integral that they're not about to part with it, even if you can show them that Jesus Christ is against it, then as I say, the question is, am I going to hold to this or am I going to hold to Christ? I used to think I could do both. I now realize I can't do both. Am I committed to this kind of evangelism or am I committed to Jesus Christ? And as I say, if you hang in there with this, to him that hath Christ shall be taken away from him even that which he hath when, as a matter of fact, he does not have and hold to the whole truth. I don't want, again, let me add just a word before I close. I, this is very heavy, I realize, and particularly in our time, as we'll notice later on, where the Arminians are overwhelmingly dominant in the conservative circles. I'm not saying Arminians aren't Christians. I am saying they are doing something very unchristian, very anti-Christian. And I am saying that I believe they don't see that, and if they ever do see it, they'll cease to be Arminians, and I've met many like that, and I thank God for them. But if they ever do see, and if any of you in the audience here who are Arminian can see any validity in the criticism which we're making here and don't act accordingly, don't eschew your Arminianism, then your whole Christian faith will come into question. I remember when the Edwards and his thoughts on the revival, the very end of it, or near the end of it, a sort of practical application. He's saying to his Arminian friends, can't you see? God has really awakened New England. He has brought many souls into the kingdom. And it's been by reformed truth. Lay down your arms. Recognize that if you do love Jesus Christ, you have erred in your theological system. He begged them, as it were, to give up their Arminian. I do the same thing. Any Arminian in the audience, I say, if you can see that... The but it's flesh is flesh, and that you're appealing to an act of the flesh and not an act of saving faith and so on. Give up your Arminianism. Show that you really love the Lord, and once you understand what he's saying, you are going to prove that by abandoning any error and embracing Jesus Christ and what you understand him to believe and teach.